said they said we need to know our weeds and that's really true we can't control anything you know we need to know each other to to work with people we need to know our weeds to work with weeds uh, we need a multi-system approach uh, diversity of management you know different ways to attack them there's no silver bullet lots and lots of little hammers and it's a job continually in our minds isn't it and we all have a job for life if we have anything to do with weeds um, so now I'd like to um, open up the um, floor to questions. Uh, questions? Yeah, hi Ben. I was hoping people might know. Um, is that okay? Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so it's basically, um, it's been produced by burning um, straw or trash to, to produce a, a chemical that then can be put back up so it can be made into a liquid form that can then be put on the soil or so we've played around with small quantities of this in the glass house and looked at what can and can't grow through smoky water but it's very good at, at stimulating growth so for black grass it's ideal it's, so if you think back to stubble burning and what we could do and what would be stimulated to grow after that is is a kind of chemical reaction within the smoke that then makes the weed seeds germinate so watch the space Thank you. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, I'm I'm not an organic grower. Um, I think it has a place, but I think it should be used um, respectfully, and I think it has been overused but I feel it still has a very important role to play in all um, horticultural and arable systems, but it should be used very wisely. Obviously, there's an issue of um, resistance risk as well, so I actually think it is a, another tool that can be used but should be respected and used wisely. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's a bit of a get-out-of-jail-free card um, in, in the past in that if you've got an unsustainable system with your selective products it allows you to redeem the situation um, which is not which is not necessarily a good thing because it allows you to continue that unsustainable system so i think it's i think it will be very sensible to plan a system um, that isn't reliant on glyphosate um, whether or not we get to keep it um, because that that glyphosate again it might be allowing you to to maintain that unsustainable system having said that I agree with Lynn, it can be a very useful tool. And obviously there's a question around conservation, agriculture, and reduced tillage, about how you maintain those systems without a non-selective herbicide. Um, is it, you know, we're, we're looking at that now, how, how sustainable, how, how possible is it? A really difficult and challenging topic, yeah, in the middle. That was easy. Thank you. Um, have you got any advice on horsetail? I'm, I'm sorry, horsetail. 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 No, it's, uh, uh, we, we've struggled with it. If you know Rothamsted, we've got a long-term experiment called Broadbork, um, and we've had real problems with equiseeds and with horsetail on, on Broadbork. Um, and the solution we came up with was rolling it, trying to crush it to, to allow some of the a, a chemical product in. Um, so that, that's the way we, we, we rolled it, tried to crush it, and then apply a herbicide. Okay, it's something that we'll be looking into a bit more detail with the electrical weeding system, and I think that is something that could work really well. But it would perhaps need to be integrated with something else as well. Maybe rolling would be a good option. But I think though, you know, that's something is worked really well on docks and thistles. Um, so we're hoping that that might be something we could we could um, tackle. Is it a very large area of protection? Yeah, it's like very prevalent over an acre and a half our field. Right, um, we've tried digging it out every single year for like five years, we've tried mulching it, um, being really on top of it with hoeing, and it is just incredibly persistent. When you say mulching, do you use plastic mulch? Yeah, oh, like, right. like laying down my pecs and just planting right. through that. Right, Oh, well, uh, yeah, different field. <laughs> <laughs> Easy. <laughs> Thanks for that useful answer. <laughs> um, another question. Yeah, with this gentleman here. Um, I'd like to take the opportunity of um, thanking Jess uh, because many years ago he came to my farm and called me Prince of Wales. 
Could you use the microphone? Sorry, Mr. Trevor. You call me the Prince of Growers. I'd like to return the compliment and call him the King of Growers. But I've, there's one thing that was mentioned earlier, and that was the um, ambiance between uh, cooch grass and buckwheat. Now, on my little farm that I've been running for 15 years, I've done a lot of research on that, and it works. Um, it doesn't always work. You've got, to, you've got to sow your buckwheat with an ascending moon, and I'm not, I'm not a biodynamic person at all, but I've had success by sowing it at the right time, which is May or June, with the ascending moon, and I use it to keep the cooch in tone. That's the, what I mean to say is I have a, a hectare field, and in the middle I have three rows of fruit trees. And every year the cooch tends to come into my growing area, so I use buckwheat, and it works absolutely perfectly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Lynn, you mentioned yeah, it. Okay. I mean, that's really great to hear. I'm really impressed. We, we had some very challenging years with our trials and, and the difficulty with buckwheat. Obviously, we needed the moisture in the spring um, to get it growing properly to be competitive enough. And there are no varieties that are, fro are, to are frost tolerant. So we were unable to do anything in the autumn and, and see the crop through. So, uh, you know, but it's really encouraging to hear that people are doing that in practice and it is working. I, th I think the cooch grass one is one, you know, we can just uh, mention black grass and you know going back to the glyphosate if if we um, lose glyphosate then everyone will be worrying about cooch grass much more and it brings these things to the fore yes further questions back to where you use the analogy of the sieve and uh, you know having um, diversity isn't it and uh, appreciating diversity yeah. so, so I, I've kind of got two hats that Rotham said one is on, on the weed control and weed management side and the other is on farmland biodiversity um, and, and what we try and do is so when we talk about weed traits we talk about response traits how they respond to management and their effect traits and one of their effect traits is providing resources for bees or farmland birds or beneficial insects and if you put those two things together, if you can predict how weed community changes in response to management, you can also predict how it will benefit carabids or bees or, or ladybirds. And so we, we are putting those two, two sides together, which is another reason why diversity is good, because a more diverse flora supports a more diverse um, insect community. Um, can we come up the front? Thank you. <coughs> can you weeds that you've used are if you've used um, like Mexican marigolds or any of these uh, plants to control your weeds? So a question about alleliopathy. Um, yeah. Yeah. Lynn maybe first? Um, and again obviously we touched on the buckwheat and mustards are another crop that we've used as a cover crop that have a kind of alleliopathic properties. Rye, gra uh, rye itself is a crop. Um, Marigold's not one I've tried. Is that something you've used in horticultural systems? I have or? never really tried to prove alleopathy in weed control, to be honest. I've just realised, though, that I think that the speed, that some weeds are less pain painful than others. For example, speedwell, I'm sure that covers the ground in such a way that it stops the ground soil getting more of yeah. a grip. Yeah, so they can And you kind of... Mm. Well, chickweed as well, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, you tend to kind of get upset by anything that comes above knee height and chickweed as long as it's in the kind of last third of the kind of crop development it's not too much of an issue. Mm -hmm. and the the other <laughs> marigolds come up really high mm -hmm. with, with the idea that you know you... You can't see the weeds. You know it does the job for a long period of time afterwards I was just wondering if anybody had... Yeah, no, it's not so much. No, not at all. But I mean, the other building on what Jez has just said, chickweed. The other benefit for that is it's a good source of bird food. So the seed is that is ideal when we're talking about um, insects and birds as well. So, but no, Mexican marigold isn't one we've investigated. Thank you. Good. Um, there was a question, gentlemen. Yeah, there. Thank you. Prince, was it? <laughs> That's right. Carry on. Carry on. <laughs> 
About four or five years ago, the keynote speaker at the conference here was Elaine Ingham, who was waxing lyrical on getting the critical balance between bacteria and fungi in the soil for a particular plant species right. That then thrives, and the weeds in inverted commas either side then don't thrive. Has there been any experience of people trying that methodology? Um, I'll hand over. I, I think they're all thinking the same as me, <laughs> which is it's a complex situation, isn't it? And no, I mean, the, the only um, angle I've come at that from is if you have a more diverse cropping rotation, then you have a more uh, diverse microbial community as well. And again, that tends to lead to a more balanced weed community. Um, so I haven't heard of that or had any experience of that as a tactic. No, no. no. Um, we'll have to take one last question. Hi, Rachel Remnant. Um, it's a question about pasture management and managing a triple SI wetland, returning it to fen grass. And we've got an issue with hard rush in the wetter areas and creeping thistle on the drier areas and we've been controlling that by cutting and removal twice a year but I'm just wondering if it's more a symptom of soil damage um, and things will come right in their own time or whether there's something else we should be doing. It's a two hectare site so we haven't used any chemicals on it and we do light stocking with cattle from May to October. Um, Lynn, you've done yeah. some work with this sort of thing. Okay, yeah, I mean, again, cutting is great. Obviously, cutting, removing. The more you can do then to make sure you haven't got any bare ground, so making sure your sward is reseeding and making sure it's a good, dense sward, because obviously the weeds will exploit any gaps, any space that you leave behind. So, And obviously, with creeping thistle, as you know, there's a massive network underground, so you're just cutting a small part of what you can see, but there's a huge... Um, network underground of, of the official rhizome so it is you need to keep, keep cutting keep on top of that to try and exhaust that as much as possible and prevent any um, seedlings being allowed to emerge through any gaps in the sward what do you what, what's the best time to cut is it when they're just in bud ready to flower or as they're flowering or is, what's the advice on that at the moment yeah i mean the best obviously as they're putting their energy up into flowering um you, you know there's a lot of resource still pushing up to the flower. so once they're flowering you can cut then because you're there's less resource below and you'll weaken that kind of root system so but you, you obviously don't want them to seed so you need to make sure you get rid of their heads any, any thoughts on the rushes as well? I mean, again, if you're not controlling them chemically, then cutting and removing is the best. Um, you will weaken them, but again, f don't allow any gaps where they can come in, because if, if you can fill in with the grass, it's more difficult, in, they'll be in the wet areas, obviously, and that's much more difficult to get other things to germinate quickly. And just pre perhaps prevent trampling and extra you know, damage from the cattle or anything that's grazing in there because any any areas that are puddled they'll come into those areas um, but it's not again it's not a quick fix it's not an easy quick solution we're thinking about a 10 to 20 year process i'm afraid you probably are looking at that kind of length of time for those species any other comments on did you john did you want something on no i'd just be curious what you want there instead <laughs> Sounds like a great habitat zone, personally. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, it depends. What, what, what are you managing that plant community for? You know, what are the services you want out of it? Um, Plants like meadow sweet and ragged robin and yellow flag iris. Pretty, pretty and, ones. And, yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, uh, I mean, it, I think that's a really good point, though, that sometimes the battle is um, too much in certain situations. I know at Dalesford, you've definitely got a field that uh, you've kind of let um, wet up and, and kind of wild a bit in that respect. I always remember my grandfather used to say about, about thistles, you know, cut in June, you cut too soon, cut in July, short to die cut in August, seeds are all over us, and um, it's very true, isn't it? And it's amazing how the old principles um, work through. 
Um, I think we'll draw this session to um, a close now. And um, I'd like to point out that we have a session in the um, all-date room next door, um, which is a surgery. So really, very much, we can build on some of these um, particular problem weeds and have more time to discuss it with the people who have experience.